we had invited Dave Borgeson to come. He was the director of fisheries for the state of Michigan. And he uh, eventually became a pretty close friend of mine. And uh, I remember that night because there were three people from the Fish and Wildlife Department that some of you may or may not know. The first was the commissioner, uh, Ed Kehoe. Ed was sitting there as I was talking so uh, you know, proudly about how we could establish a fishery like this that Dave had just described. And uh, all the time I could realize that what Ed was thinking was, oh my God, there go all the brook trout that I give all the fishing game clubs and I'll never keep my job. The other guy was John Anderson. <coughs> And I figured, oh my God, how are we going to convince John Anderson to be a salmon fisherman when all he fishes for is walleyes? And the third guy that was there was Angelo and Serpy. I didn't know Angelo, but I knew what a friend of mine, Ed Weed, had told me about Angelo. He said, Bill, he's about as useful as tits on a bull. <laughs> for those of you that knew Ed, you know that uh, he didn't mince his words. Well, the first 10 years when we pushed for the program, uh, we really didn't get very far. And uh, I left for a brief stint to Colorado in the late 70s. And when I came back, I found out that the Fish and Wildlife Department had started stocking salmon in uh, the Inland Sea and in Mallets Bay. And I hosted a group of um, New England sports writers. I was running a little cottage business at the time. And um, by that time, Angie had been promoted to the director of fisheries. He didn't say a lot. Um, he was pretty reserved. And he was pretty stubborn. Uh, we took him after um, the, the fishery uh, uh, that we had on the uh, uh, lake that year. Uh, up to the Lamoille River in the fall to show them how we were all catching four, five, and six pound salmon. And uh, we even gave Angie a rod, and uh, he waited out, and uh, he sure enough hooked the salmon. It was 14 inches long, and he immediately determined that we had crashed the forage base in Mallets Bay, and maybe we should stop stocking this fish. <laughs> Well, it was a pretty adversarial relationship that we had with the Fish and Wildlife Department in those days. And I was getting kind of tired of uh, all of the pushing that we had to do, getting the legislature to appropriate money for projects that they didn't want to do. And then in the third year of the fishing derby, uh, I took over running it. And uh, we, I suggested to the board that we name uh, Ed Kehoe, the commissioner, uh, to be the first honorary chairman of the Lake Champlain Fishing Derby. And we did, we sent him a letter, and I remember getting a phone call that day where the commissioner said, um, hey Bill, uh, when's this derby gonna be? And I told him, and he said, great. He said, I'd like to do a few things, so um, I've got the trucks on the way to pave the parking lot at Mallets Bay. And he said, how about fish? You know, uh, would you like 50,000, maybe 100,000 in Mallet's Bay? And I'm sitting there saying, Jesus Christ, here's a guy that has been fighting us for 10 years, and now, you know, he wants to dump half of his hatcheries, okay, into Lake Champlain. And it made me realize that uh, maybe our approach in the beginning was, was a little bit wrong, and uh, we should be, uh, uh, be a little more supportive and a little more respectful of the Fish and Game Department. And so, um, with that, uh, I turned over a new leaf, and so did a lot of the people in the department, particularly Angie. And, um, you know, knowing him and fishing with him for 44 years, I found out what a great guy he was. He's a very knowledgeable guy, but a very conservative guy, and somewhat reluctant to take chances. But once he believed in something, he was very, very dedicated. And that's the way he worked for the anglers of Vermont. And I think the best testament that I could say to Angie is that Vermont is a lot better place today for the fact that he's been here, and it's a lot better than the day he came. So with that, um, I'd just like to say uh, I'm going to miss my friend, and I hope all of you 
uh, understand the great job that he did for everybody in the state, and he had a really big impact, particularly on Lake Champlain. Uh, maybe not directly as a fisheries biologist in the end, but certainly through all of the planning and all of the appropriations and money that was necessary, okay, to make all of the programs happen. So uh, I'm very sad that uh, he's not going to be with us, and uh, I hope that Vermont sees other people like Angie come into it, its, its fault, and, um, you know, contributes as much as he did. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Uh, let's take a moment for Angie. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. At this time, we're going to bring up our friend Brian Chipman. And he's going to give us our State of the Lake. <laughs> I don't think I'll need the mic. Can you all hear me? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, thank, thank Bill for uh, uh, the kind words about An Angelo and Serpy. He was... I worked with, uh, for him, under him, for many years. Uh, first met him uh, back in, way back in 1986 when I interviewed for the job. And uh, he, he stayed as the fisheries chief uh, until, until the mid-90s. Then he, then he was promoted to the director of operations for the Fish and Wildlife Department and until his retirement in, I believe, 2001. And, uh, but he was, Bill was right, he was a very strident supporter of developing Lake Champlain into the trout and salmon fishery it is now. It was, uh, he was really instrumental working with uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, New York DEC, they all got along very well together. And uh, that's, that's where I'm going to start us off here. Maybe you can drop the lights. Yeah. <laughs> there we are. And and again, this this is a uh, cooperative effort. Uh, Lake Champlain being the inter interstate uh, resource. Uh, it really can't be done with the work of one agency, one state, but uh, the, the uh, partnership, long partnership uh, since the early 1970s with uh, Vermont, New York, and, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has really put together a, uh, a great program that's uh, been, you know, been reaping some good benefits here. And I, I'm going to start out by uh, a little discussion of what, what we've, we've been stocking lately uh, and then focusing on our, our uh, landlocked salmon assessments in, in uh, 97, uh, 2017 and, um, and compare it to some of the historical data and a little bit about a uh, salmon stocking evaluation we just uh, finished up as well. So to start with, just about every year, we stock over a half a million trout and salmon in, into Lake Champlain. Uh, the vast majority being being landlocked salmon. Uh, smolts, yearlings are the bulk of the stocking. Also, some of the tributaries get uh, fry and uh, fall fingerling stocking. The fingerlings are going into the Huntington River mainly right now. They have been for the last few years, and uh, partly in the Winooski River. And uh, a lot of fry is also being stocked in uh, several of the New York tributaries, the Saranac, uh, Austable, and Boquette rivers. And uh, we also, as well, lake trout and, and uh, good numbers of brown trout and steelhead. So get on to uh, the main part of the uh, talk here, talking about our salmon assessments. We, we do our salmon population assessments in the fall. Uh, during, when, when they start to run the, the, uh, the tributaries 
and uh, we, we, collect, we collect these fish and uh, tag them and release a lot of them and uh, take a lot of them into the hatchery for uh, brood stock to provide eggs for uh, hatchery production, uh, evaluate their health and, and uh, monitor lamprey wounding on, on salmon and this all occurs in the fall, mid-September through mid-November. And as well, we, we have some uh, uh, nearshore sampling areas where we find uh, some good concentrations of salmon that aren't in the spawning populations in, that, in any given year. And uh, we, we generally do that by uh, electrofishing and on these nearshore areas in Wallen Bay and Willsboro Bay uh, uh, at uh, nighttime uh, for several weeks or uh, several days in November. And we uh, work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service both out there with crews doing this work. So starting with the Winooski <coughs> River, the, 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 the fish, fish lift trap and truck facility, which is, has been uh, going on at the, uh, at the lowest dam, the Winooski One hydroelectric facility since 1993, and it's, uh, and it's, it, it's allowed to uh, uh, send, send salmon upstream into, into some of the spawning areas. And uh, just, oh, wrong way. And, uh, just recently, we've uh, gotten uh, documented natural reproduction from, from salmon that are spawning up in the Huntington River and the Winooski River in the Richmond area. So uh, this, this is new, and we hope we can keep that going, get, get, uh, get a wild run going. So uh, the, uh, this is a, a, a trend of, of uh, the numbers of, of uh, salmon that we've collected in the fish lift and, and uh, moved upstream in most years. Uh, last, last fall we, we uh, moved, lifted, collected 84 salmon, which is pretty close to the 2016 level. Uh, quite, a, quite a drop from the record in 2014 where we had 158. And again, this, this, uh, the black line here is the uh, lamprey wounding rates that we've measured from year to year. And see, we've, we're down at the the last several years, and about the lowest levels of wounding rates in um, on salmon with from lampreys, reducing the lamprey populations uh, that that we ever have, and, and it's you can really see the since those wounding levels have dropped, the overall uh, on average the numbers of salmon uh, coming into the river here is uh, is more consistently increased, much greater than when the wounding rates were high, and uh, Brad. Brad Young here from Fish and Wildlife Service will he'll he'll get deep dive into the uh, uh, sea lamprey control program a little more later on today. Uh, the Boquette River over in New York, uh, the uh, the lower dam in Willsboro was removed in, in 2015, and that there used to be a fishway as you can see on the left in the upper picture uh, that. Uh, they had very varying levels of success in moving moving salmon up. It didn't didn't move in great numbers, but since the dam was removed, uh, there there is some thoughts that the salmon might not always be able to get up through those ledges, especially during low flows. And uh, the Fish and Wildlife, uh, with the help from, I think from New York as well, Fish and Wildlife Service has been netting salmon uh, down below these ledges in the fall and trucking them upstream to salmon uh, spawning areas. And uh, they've been pretty successful over the last three years since the dam was taken out. Uh, uh, generally, you know, 80 to a, uh, close to 150 fish uh, each year. And and they similar to uh, the Winooski River, they moved about the same same numbers as the Winooski has the last couple of years. So they, they haven't been able to get up those places, Brian. Well, that's that's interesting. You know, we uh, I'll get get to that a little bit. Just this last summer, there's, there's been a, a research project with some graduate students from uh, Concordia University up in Quebec uh, doing, doing a study of uh, natural reproduction in salmon. And they did document salmon fry uh, produced naturally in the north branch of the Boquette River. And interestingly, they, they uh, did, did some genetic analysis, of, uh, took, took small thin samples of the um, salmon that they moved upstream to do, do genetic analysis to actually identify, uh, get a genetic fingerprint of each one. And, uh, they, and then when they went up into the north branch and collected these fry, they took samples from the fry and did genetic analysis on them 
and they could actually they could take that information and actually uh, uh, determine from the genetic analysis which which pair of uh, of uh, salmon that was moved up upstream spawned them. And they had they had several fry up there that they collected and analyzed that didn't match to any of the uh, of the salmon that they actually moved upstream. So the, so we know that there's there were some salmon getting up above uh, the falls on their own, which is really good news too. And uh, another uh, where we see most of our fish on the Vermont side is in Hatchery Brook, uh, the outflow uh, discharge stream of the Edwee Fish Culture Station. And uh, we uh, have, have a trap that we have uh, constructed there in 2014 uh, that uh, has really improved our efficiency in collecting and handling fish there. Uh, we used to uh, do some electrofishing and netting of the fish uh, throughout the stream, which, which was hard work and a little harder on the fish as well. And uh, again, with Hatchery Brook, we've seen a, a more steady returns and, and a really big jump in 2015 with close to 1,500 fish that came in, but it was rather disappointing. The runs we've seen uh, a big drop last year, in, or in 2016, and then only 164 fish we uh, collected there this last fall. And uh, that, I think that you'll probably agree that uh, pretty much matches up with the, your experiences fishing. I know the, the, uh, the overall numbers of salmon in the lake were kind of down this, this last season. Uh, and uh, going on to, to some of our uh, other tributaries which we sampled by electrofishing, we saw uh, similar declines in uh, fish from the Lamoille River. Again, uh, not, not quite to the level that, that we've had uh, relative to the Hatchery Brook, but still uh, uh, we're seeing, you know, overall the trend is similar to what we've seen on these other tributaries with low wounding rates. Uh, higher levels of fish, but uh, not not in 2017, which was kind of an anomaly. Uh, Otter Creek, we saw the same type of thing, and uh, as well as the Missisquoi, which has just recently become stocked with salmon, and uh, we had a slight decline of, uh, of the numbers of fish we collected there as well. So what's going on here? Um, this, I, I put together some uh, link frequency graphs of all the salmon from the main from the main lake uh, that entered tributaries for the Winooski River, Otter Creek, Hatchery Brook, and also the Boquette River, and uh, you can see the the distribution of sizes, and these are all inch groups. Uh, the lengths the lengths of fish in, in a normal year we would see a lot of a big peak in the numbers of fish in the 19 to 22 inch range, and that's those fish that have been out, out in the lake uh, over one, one year since stocking, the, uh, the one, one lake year fish, they've gone through two summers. And uh, the same thing in 2016, and we don't see that here. <coughs> but we do see a greater prevalence of larger fish out there uh, that, that came in this year. And which, you know, which we've never, never really seen before. Uh, in the Inland Sea, Mallets Bay uh, tributaries, these are from the Lamoille River and the Missiscoy River. Uh, kind of a similar uh, event, uh, not, not many fish in, the, uh, in this middle range, which usually has been, been the peak of, of, those same, of, the, of that same age class. And uh, looking, looking at our nearshore collections, uh, it's not quite as different as it was in previous years. Um, but one, one thing that is encouraging that we had a, a really a good crop of, uh, of, of the 2017 stocking, those zero lake year fish that, that just went through their first summer, and that's in that 14 to 18 inch year uh, length groups there. And uh, so, so there was a lot, a lot of these young fish coming in, which is good, and, but, but still uh, slightly less of, of that middle middle area uh, in the 18, 19, the 20, 21 inch, inch class, a little less than we've seen in previous years, but generally these fish um, out in the lake that aren't spawning, they're dominated by the younger fish, but uh, 
but there are there there are some uh, you know larger one two and even uh, three lake year fish out there sometimes that uh, uh, decide they don't want to go in and spawn and that, and and that's what's providing you know providing the fishing in the late fall. Why if you were able to overlay lamprey hits to that, you suppose that that would give you the truth of why you're getting those larger fish showing. No, it, 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 as you saw in the earlier graphs, it, the lamprey wound is staying low on salmon. It, ha it hasn't really changed appreciably in the last five or six years. So that doesn't explain it, but I, I, I well, think there might be something else going on. Well, the, 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 the wounding rate is only the fish that survive. Yeah. That, that's right. So if, if, if fish get hit and they're dead, they don't count in the rates. But as, as, as lamprey get better and better, your wounding rate might not drop off, or you might not have as many dead fish in the lake either. Yeah. That might mean why you're getting that's bigger what I'm fish. Saying, you're getting a larger fish off. Well, that's why I would love it. Well, that, that, that could dead be. Dead fish yeah. don't have a number. Yeah. <laughs> but this is, this is from our aging, age determination of fish. Um, and you can see in most years, for the last five years, it's been up around 80% of uh, the one lake year fish in the lake, and that's that's those ones that have been through two summers, and uh, and we had a big a big drop down to about four, only making up only 45 percent of uh, the fish this last year, and uh, again uh, greater greater numbers greater numbers of the zero in the uh, in the the cage two fish, and that's kind of showing the proportion of each of those age classes and uh, looking at the numbers it, uh, it, it, it kind of makes a little more sense what's going on looking looking at the, the total numbers caught say in Hatchery Brook we've generally been for, you know close to 50 of these age zero fish we only had eight in 2016 which is pretty low and that that corresponds to 2017's catch of a low number of the one year uh, the one lake year fish. And that trend is the same thing in the Lamoille River and the Winooski River, the same same type of relationship here. But what's encouraging is in sheer numbers we had many more of the two and three lake year fish in 2017 than we had in those previous four years. So you know 50 versus between 18 and 30 some fish in Hatchery Brook. Uh, Almost double the uh, numbers of fish we usually see in the Lamoille River, and almost double the, of those fish we usually see in the Winooski River, which, which is uh, pretty encouraging. I think I think you know uh, lower lower lamprey numbers explain part of it, but looking at this precipitous drop in one year of, of a change doesn't doesn't to me point to the lamprey predation levels because the lamprey wounding rates have been fairly stable for salmon over this, <coughs> this same period. That being said, Brian, yeah. I mean, it's, it's anecdotal, yeah. but what we're seeing out there um, is less and less and less of, uh, of a wounding rates. Wounds on fish, yeah. Okay. I mean, we're not, we're not taking scientific numbers, <coughs> but it's right. pretty obvious that we're seeing. I mean, this, this year we got into a great batch of uh, three-year-olds this fall. Mm -hmm. And very rarely did we see a lamprey on it. I have, I have well, one. Good. I had one lamprey in the boat all fall, and that came yeah. off the pancake. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, for these several, you know, several hundred fish that, that we handle uh, each year, the you know the lamprey wounding rates have been pretty steady between 15 and 17 to 19 wounds per hundred fish since about 2012, 2011, and. Uh, I think there may be another another thing that's happened here is that since we had such a drop in the in the in the uh, one lake year fish in this last year, and that showed up as zero age fish in 2016, it seems like they had some kind of post stocking failure. It may have been there may have been just the timing between when they were stocked and, and when uh, when Plankton production and and, uh, and larval fish, forage fish, uh, the young food for these young young salmon became available. It, it, it's possible. It's 
quite possible that uh, something happened in the early spring of 2016 that wasn't very kind to the, the newly stocked fish. And we did see a kind of a corresponding drop in the number of brown trout and steelhead coming back in 2017 as well. So, that, I, yeah. think, I think you're going to see it again. Last year mm -hmm. in the fall, we saw very few smolts harvested. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then last spring, everyone says, "Well, where's the you know two-year-olds mm -hmm. one year in the lake?" Yeah. Um, and and they were very hard to find. Mm -hmm. This year, there were virtually no smolts caught. Period. Yeah, but they they came See, back. Last last year we picked the smolts, and yeah. we had very few two-year-olds this spring. This fall, we virtually had no smolts, mm -hmm. which makes next spring look scary. But in the fish coming back to the rivers, we had we had pretty good numbers of uh, of of those same year stocked fish coming back. You, know, well, you, you look in, tw in this this fall, we had thirty seven of those uh, twenty seventeen stock fish in the sample, and the year before we had only eight. And uh, I, you know I think these these seem to the trends seem to be the same or very similar between these. Uh, three tributaries here, and uh, so I think we're going to have a, a a little, you know, a better crop of these surviving uh, through through this this next year than than you saw last year, certainly. And I, I also know that there seem to be folks fishing in the southern end of the lake got into a lot more of those small fish than those fishing in the northern end of the lake, and they must have spent more time down there for some reason. And, but uh, they. They did show, you know, they did show back up, and I think I think that's encouraging for the for the near future here. But also those those two and three lake year fish coming in in greater numbers that may have been a result of fewer one the one lake year fish out in the lake this this last summer, and that that's just a function of less competition out there for for resources for food, and more more of them survived uh, through through the year. That's, that's very possible. Southern end of the lake at Christmas, the week before Christmas, it was big from 80 feet to the surface. Yeah. And seagulls pounding the water and the wounds sitting there too. Well, that's something we haven't seen in quite a while. Right. Yeah, of, of the smelt and alewives being so concentrated, they, they've been patchy the last few years. John and I fished the last the Thursday before Christmas. It was insane. Mm -hmm. Was there a lot of salmon with them? And brown trout. So to, just to summarize where we went with the salmon uh, in 2017, we certainly was a sharp decline in abundance. And it's all related to the poor survival of those age one lake year salmon. And, and uh, by the looks of things, given the last two years returns, in our sampling that uh, most of the losses of this edge class likely occurred within the first weeks or months after stocking in 2016. Uh, we've seen uh, a little more normal numbers of these, of these young salmon in the runs this last fall, which I, you know, again, I, I think is closer to normal and, and I think that uh, they, they should bounce back in the coming year. And we have, you know, in better survival of age two and three than we've seen probably ever, um, which I hope hope continues. But uh, we'll we'll see what what uh, you know the, the more the more even distribution of the uh, age, you know, the one lake year with the two lake year fish. If there's if there's we see more of those uh, younger fish staying in the in the in the lake in the population. If, we'll see if this. Uh, Still holds, or if, it, if if we have a drop in numbers of H two or three, it may be that there's some some relationship to competition with uh, the more <coughs> younger younger age class. You know, it's just not we just don't have have enough information to really nail that down. But that's that's uh, kind of a theory. Yeah. Well, I see the reproductive implications of having a greater proportion of older and bigger fish uh, as spawning. Could we have better hatch rates of the eggs that have weighed more eggs for spawning pair, greater genetic fitness? Is that a possibility? Yeah, for you know, for one thing, the lar the larger fish do produce more eggs, and 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 
and also the eggs are often in better condition. Uh, Kevin Kelsey's here from the Edweed Fish Culture Station. You might be able to elaborate on that. As long as you're here? <laughs> yeah. In, in, in most cases, I would say yes. I mean, we'd like to see all your classes when we're, when we're spawning fish, but you will get more eggs uh, out of the older fish. Um, on the farther end of the spectrum, uh, beyond age two or three, which we don't see many of, um, usually the much older fish uh, tend to have less viable uh, eggs as well as sperm from, from the male. So, um, but to have some two and three late year fish mixed in, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Yes. But it is possible that could be a cormorant problem because they're going to eat more than small before they eat the big. So the bigger they get, their, their chances of survival are much better. Is it is it possible that it could be the cormorants eating a lot I, of these small? I, I don't think to see going? see such an abrupt change in one year when uh, you know cormorant cormorant levels have been high for the last two or three years or longer, and uh, and it, that just you know it doesn't. It, it doesn't make sense to me that uh, they they remove half of a year class in one in one year where there was you know uh, similar large numbers in the in the in the previous couple of years. And the other possibility is uh, the white perch population or some other predator fish. Is there a way you guys could um, when these fish start coming up missing? Is there any way you can do a study, but like shocking some of the white perch or something? And see what they're eating, just to see. Well, these salmon, these salmon are going in, you know, in the lake, stocked in the lake into rivers as small. So they're they're averaging around seven, seven, eight inches, and that's way too big for any white perch to eat. Uh, the, the only, the only other, coming up on you know, per, you know, predation is is going to happen. That's you know, that's why we stock so many fish to get the numbers we do. Um, that's kind of a part, you know, part of the natural system. Uh, uh, lake trout may eat some. Uh, you know, larger salmon would eat them. Uh, uh, birds. Uh, you know, not only cormorants, but other, you know, other other birds, loons that are traveling through. And but the, uh, it's, the, num the numbers in flocks of cormorants that we noticed on the lake this past spring, and the feeding frenzies that we watched in Sioux, especially in late April and May, were unlike anything I've ever seen on the water before. They, they're, they're, they're not to normal trends, and they will, from, from what I saw, what I saw throughout May this year scared the daylights out of me. Yeah, I, I don't have any information on cormorant population levels, maybe uh, Brian Kluber can elaborate on that. I, uh, I, I just, ha I haven't seen any estimates of uh, the population, and, you know, and just, and the bulk of them are over on the Four Brothers in New York, and and uh, I don't know what the actual trend in the, in the numbers uh, how, how many is. salmon do we put in apple, or how, how many fish, salmon and browns, do we put in the apple island? Area? That's about 15,000. <coughs> right there. The right apple there. Island, yeah. Because every day, all spring, you can sit right there, and there's a flock of cormorants sitting right there every day, all spring, feeding. Well, yeah, probably those fish, those birds. fish are getting, yeah, those fish are getting devoured. Well, we, and they get, and, 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 and I swear I think they get better at it every year. <laughs> well, the, the salmon, the salmon are stocked in, in mid to late March and early April before the cormorants get here. So they've dispersed by the time the cormorants are uh, show up. Okay, I'd like to go on to, uh, this uh, stocking evaluation, I think I talked a little bit about it last year. Uh, we looked, you know, we were assessing for the last several years the performance of, uh, of uh, fish produced from feral returning fish from the lake and, uh, from the, and also from those produced by the uh, domestic brood stock, which is kept in the hatchery. And, uh, you know, we, we, we know that uh, keeping fish, salmon, or other species in, in uh, in dom domestic situations in, in a hatchery environment does change their fitness and uh, in a may it, in a may affect uh, how they how they survive in a wild a lot of that hasn't really been quantified but we 
we wanted to see if those fish that were stocked in the lake and were adapted enough to survive and return as spawners uh, would have any advantage as far as their offspring. And this is, this is what we uh, started doing here. We stocked uh, several rivers concentrating on the inland sea and also uh, off Hatchery Brook, Hatchery Cove where we stocked uh, equal numbers of, of uh, salmon produced from eggs from feral returning fish, mainly into Hatchery Brook, and also the fish that are kept, um, the, the salmon brood line uh, that's kept in captivity at the Bald Hill Hatchery. And uh, we, over, over the five year period, we were very close to 50-50 in the, in the uh, numbers of feral versus the, the domestic base fish stock. And it was uh, quite remarkable, uh, this, this graph, the first two bars in each year are the numbers stocked of uh, each of the experimental groups. And, and then with the blue, the blue bar is the, uh, the, the feral produced fish that are returned. And the red bar on, on the right in each year is the uh, domestic return. So we had some, you know, we didn't even expect to see this great a difference, but uh, it was a huge impact. Those uh, uh, offspring from the feral fish came back in, uh, re in spawning runs at much greater levels than the, the domestic returns, and, and it averaged, uh, you know, close to two and a half to one. And uh, we also looked at some other, other aspects of them. They didn't really differ much in, uh, in their their growth rates, their, their, their length of age was very, was very similar. Those uh, uh, bars, those, they're called error bars that go up and down the big, uh, the, uh, the bigger bars, they, they show uh, that when there's an overlap between two groups that there's no statistical or significant difference in the, uh, in the, the measurement for each of the experimental groups. So there's no real difference in the growth rates between these two fish out in the lake. Also looked at the fishery. In the, in the creel surveys we've done in, the, in recent years, during this period, we had pretty close to the same, same amount of feral and domestic salmon caught that, that our creel clerks had actually examined. And they were very, very similar in, uh, in uh, length and weight. And we saw a similar pro uh, data with the New York Salmonid Angler Diary Program data, uh, but they showed a little more, uh, and small numbers of fish, but the, they caught more feral fish than they did domestic fish in, uh, in both out in the lake and in the tributaries. So in summary, the, the feral origin salmon outperformed the domestic or, origin salmon. Uh, in the spawning runs by an average of 2.4 to 1. There was no difference in growth, little difference in returns to the fishery that we could see. Uh, so starting, you know, starting this year, we're going to put the priority on taking eggs from these, from these uh, fish coming back from the lake as, uh, and get as many as we can for, uh, for our Lake Champlain production. We'll still maintain the domestic brood stock as a backup egg source to make up for any, any shortfalls we get with, uh, with the uh, runs from the wild, which are, you know, which can be unpredictable, but, you know, we, we think we'll still get the vast majority, if not all, of our eggs from these uh, returning fish. And uh, to, to really enhance the tributary spawning runs, we're going to concentrate when we do have domestic uh, fish in production to stock all the feral offspring and tributaries first. <laughs> and uh, that would uh, enhance the spawning runs and also improve the tributary fishing opportunities we expect. And uh, the, uh, any, any domestic offspring we will kind of target for stocking out in the lake for the lake fishery, since they, they won't uh, necessarily be uh, as, as well imprinted to returning to a stream, but, but they, they should still provide some fishing out in the lake. And uh, this, you know, and this, this uh, break down a fish, we, we always stock a portion of, of the salmon directly into the lake at certain access points and off the ferries, as well as stocking them in the river. So that's, that's all I have today, and um, 
thank you for your attention. And if we have any more questions, I'd be glad to see if I can answer some. Yeah. Uh, we all like to catch big fish, or hope to catch big fish. Is that angling pressure? And you know, given the amount of fish we might catch, you know, for big fish in a year, I don't know, over five or six pounds, I don't know how many. Thousand, two thousand fish, or maybe I don't know. Is that going to affect the lake population in any way? Does it hurt the? Well, I, I don't think it it hurts the population. You know, we're we're supporting we're supporting it by stocking, right. and our primary objective is is to is to provide a quality fishing opportunity. And that's that's what we're there for. Is to is to you know is to catch and, and take. Okay. And, uh, uh, obviously, you know those those of you, and I think a lot of you in this in this room are avid. And you, you're out there a lot, and you're catching a lot of fish. So, uh, you know, uh, re releasing a lot of your catch and taking good care of those fish you release is important too. Thank you. Thank you. Here, another question? Yeah. Yeah, the fish that are captured uh, at the Winooski One that you bring up to the high tech, <coughs> yep. do you have any documented proof that any of those fish ever get back to the lake? And the smolt that are hatching out there, what kind of a return rate do you expect on them after running through three hydro dams and turbines? Well, we've, we've, uh, the first part of the question is, yes, a lot, a lot of those salmon are getting spawning and going back downstream because we, we're, we're tagging all those fish. And uh, we've had quite a few salmon caught out in the lake uh, with tags that were sent back to us. And they were from salmon that we've moved upstream the previous year, in a couple cases, two years previous. So, so uh, uh, there's at least a portion of the salmon that are, that are going up there are surviving, spawning, going back down over the dams and back out into the lake. And, and we've had, you know, we've had uh, quite a few recaptured fish coming back to the fishway, the fish lift in, in the Winooski One Dam uh, in, uh, in consecutive years, too. Uh, your other question is about the, the uh, smolts that are produced up in the Huntington and the Winooski going downstream. Uh, we've, we've had, had some research um, done on that recently. And uh, and we found that uh, the uh, there's there is a downstream passage um, flume at the Essex at the Essex 19 dam, which we evaluated in the last couple of years, and uh, with some uh, putting putting some radio transmitters and some smolts that were released up upstream, and uh, found out it wasn't pr it wasn't producing it wasn't wasn't giving us the results we would like. You know there's Seem to be a lot of uh, a lot of loss of those fish going over the dam, or, or in fact, uh, we were able to set up uh, the folks that were doing the uh, the project um, set up receivers that were able to track what direction the smolts took. Some they could they could identify which ones went through the turbines, which ones went over the dam, which ones went through the the, the downstream passage. Uh, Bypass, and and, uh, and they found that um, the downstream passage wasn't working as, as expected, and, and and they they didn't get many surviving uh, going down that way. Um, and I, I think of forty some fish that were that were radio tagged. Um, I think half of them made it down below, roughly below the Essex Dam. Uh, and uh, half of them again made it below the uh, other two dams, and I think I think just a couple were were picked up on the receivers at the mouth of the Winooski headed out to the lake. So we we know we have some work to do there, and, and we've had uh, 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 engineering experts from from the Fish and Wildlife Service who who uh, specialize in fish passage facilities. Uh, Working with Green Mountain Power to improve uh, the the efficiency of the downstream passage for smolts, uh, to to uh, you know to, to to make to make that facility more friendly to fish, to pass more, uh, and uh, reduce reduce the uh, losses we're we're currently seeing. But and also coming back coming back to the fish lift there, 
I should say another thing, we're, get, we're getting, we are getting fish that we have marked from upstream uh, that have had, had uh, fin clips that were specific to, to uh, those fish that were either stocked as <coughs> fingerlings in the fall up, up in the Huntington River or the Winooski River and also those uh, produced from the fry stocking that we collected and uh, tagged and uh, fin clipped and released back in the river and we found, found that these clips are coming back as adults to the fish lift uh, at the lower dam so we know there's some getting there are some getting out there and surviving and coming back that were uh, originating from up above the dams in the, in the Winooski watershed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As always, very efficient. Good job by Brian. Uh, next up, we have Brian Kluver from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Migratory Bird Division, Champlain Cormorant Issue. He's going to give us some clarification, but we also have an attendance. Uh, Andrew Milliken, who is the complex manager of Lake Champlain Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office in Essex. And he's just going to say a few words and then Brian's going to give us his presentation. So, Andrew? Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so, I'm Andrew Milliken and I'm a project leader for the Lake Champlain Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office where Brad Young and, and Tony and others work on lamprey <coughs> control as well as the salmon restoration program. You've I think you've heard from Bill Ardrin in the past mm -hmm. years, and, and then the Habitat program working on aquatic connectivity and in-stream restoration. Uh, and also overseeing the, the two national fish hatcheries in Vermont, the White River and Eisenhower, as well as one in the Berkshires, the Berkshire National Fish Hatchery. And a lot of the effort of those stations is to really try to uh, sustain this salmonid fishery in, in uh, Lake, Sh Lake Champlain, along with the Lake Champlain Fish and Wildlife Management Cooperative. So I'm really happy to be here and, and uh, hear from you uh, about all the work that's going on and any questions and concerns you have. Um, hopefully some of you got to know Dave Tilton when he was in this position and I uh, look forward to, to working with you and talking with you at the break. Um, and thanks for the hat. I love it. <laughs> The other thing I'll just say is I, I wanted to thank Brian from, from, for coming here from our regional office in, in Hadley, Massachusetts to talk about the Cormoran issue. I know it's a really important issue and I think this is a really important conversation today to talk about kind of where we are and, and what some of the next steps are. So, appreciate it. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Basketball would probably be better than listening to me, but um, we'll get it switched around here shortly. Sorry. <laughs>